Ani, bonjour, welcome everyone to the fifth and final installment of CROSH COVID Conversations. My name is Toby Mankus, and I'm the Science Communication Officer at CROSH, the Center for Research in Occupational Safety and Health. We're streaming live from the CROSH lab at Laurentian University. We acknowledge the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850 and recognize that Laurentian University is located on the traditional grounds of Tikamishing Anishinaabek. The city of Greater Sudbury also includes the traditional lands of Wanabate First Nation. CROSH COVID Conversations is a five-part webinar series of the intersection of occupational safety and health and COVID-19. Our panelists will speak for 15 minutes each, and then we'll have 10 minutes of audience questions. You can enter the questions at any time in the chat function of the platform you're watching this on. I'll then ask your questions to our panelists during the Q&A section. Today, we'll be discussing biological mechanisms of COVID-19 infection, herd immunity, how vaccines work, and why vaccination is important for the workplace. Our panelists are Dr. Sandra Dorman and Dr. Caitlin Malarkey. Dr. Sandra Dorman is a full professor in the Faculty of Health at Laurentia University and is the director of CROSH. Her expertise is in respiratory physiology and immunology, and her research program focuses on health promotion and disease prevention in the occupational setting. She has a track record for successfully addressing workplace identified problems and communicating information back to the host organization. She's authored over 25 papers and received over $5 million in research funding. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Dorman. Thank you for having me and welcome everybody for our uh, final webinar of this series. Um, I'm excited to talk to you today about immunology. It's one of my favorite uh, topics. So let's dive in. Um, I wanted to talk to you about coronavirus, um, also more commonly called uh, COVID-19. And um, I wanna talk to you a little bit about how it actually infects our bodies so that you have a hopefully better understanding of the different ways that scientists and researchers are trying to um, use therapeutics to prevent uh, infection or to uh, help us get better more quickly. Um, so COVID-19 as, as a, you know, short form comes from coronavirus disease 2019 when it started, right? And I, and I like to say the corona piece because um, corona means crown um, and, uh, you know, coronaviruses have been around for a long time. They're a recognized group of viruses and they were called corona because when scientists first put them um, like on a electron microscope a view, you could see the circle of the virus and then all of these studdings that created like a halo around the virus. And, and uh, whimsically, I guess, the scientist who, who looked at that said, it looks like the virus is wearing a crown. <laughs> and they called it Corona. Um, it, that's, that's kind of interesting and, and kind of pertinent in, in that, you know, when you look at the actions of the coronavirus, that crown uh, feature is, is really important for how the virus infects us. And so, um, you know, I'm sure all of you at this point have seen some kind of cartoon image representation of the coronavirus and, and they typically show it, you know, it's a beach ball with these red studs all the way around it. And the red studs are what create that crown effect. And if you zoomed in on any one of those crowns or those, those red studs, to me, they kind of look like a, a broccoli uh, stalk or, or a tree, right? And, and that stud has a name, they call it the spike protein, which is, I find immunological names are often quite cool like that. So it's the spike protein and uh, scientists have, have broken the spike protein down into two parts. So the, the tree part or, or, you know, the bushy part at the top is the spike one portion of the protein, very clever, S1, and the stock part is S2, or the, the spike protein portion two. And um, those two pieces are actually both very important in how you become infected with uh, coronavirus. Um, you'll, the stock you'll notice is the part that sticks right into the virus, right? And, and the tree-like portion is, is what is exposed to the outside world. And so when the virus is, is kind of inhaled into you and, and flying into your body. It's the, the tree-like portion that's going to stick to the outside of your cell. It's gonna allow it to make contact with your cell. 
And actually, it's not just sticking anywhere on the cell, it's sticking on a very uh, specific protein. Um, and that kind of allows it to dock on the outside of the cell. That's the S1 protein, okay? The S2 protein, if, if you imagine your cells, ha, um, you know, they're like castles. They keep everything out, but there's portals to the castles. Um, the, the coronavirus is sticking to one of those portals. The S1 part sticks to the door. The S2 part turns the knob and allows them to go in. So the S2 protein is what actually allows the virus to get inside your cell and infect it. Right. So you can see, like before even going too much farther, why targeting both the S1 and or the S2 protein on coronaviruses would be important to preventing infection because they're both so critical to how the virus gets into your cells. Right. So I want to segue from there and talk about, OK, well, what's the portal on your cell? What is it? What is the virus sticking to? And that is also. Um, a, a protein that's called ACE2 protein, basically. Um, and what's interesting about ACE2 protein, well, first and foremost, where do you find ACE2 proteins? Well, there's lots of ACE2 proteins on your lung cells, lots on your blood vessels, on your gut, and on your kidney, right? So that makes sense because here's a virus that is predominantly um, being passed through the airways, right? It, it wouldn't be successful. It didn't have something to bind on to in the airways. You can also see how it can spread to other sites because there's receptor in the blood vessels. You can also see how actually, you know, I mean, A, why people will often have gastrointestinal symptoms when they're infected with uh, COVID. And how, you know, when you go to the bathroom then, whether you pee or you poo, you're, you're shedding virus into the wastewater as well. Which if you haven't seen, uh, I think it was webinar number three on uh, one of the things we looked at was uh, measuring COVID in wastewater. So you can go back and check that out. <laughs> Anyways, um, so, so ACE2 protein is in a lot of important organs in your body that are related to infection. The other thing about ACE2, um, most of you are aware that there's, there's a certain health profile that's linked with worse outcomes with uh, COVID-19 disease, right? Um, age, um, what your baseline health is, as well as uh, whether you have a, a healthy diet and, and, and uh, regular exercise. And actually the functioning of the ACE2 protein links up to that health profile so that um, it, it may be part of the reason why um, some people have worse outcomes when they're infected with COVID-19 than others. So I wanna talk about that a little bit and explain that. So, so what does ACE2 protein do? Basically, it balances the levels of two important hormones in your body, angiotensin II and angiotensin 1 to 7. I know the names are kind of long, but angiotensin 2 is a hormone that's involved in increasing blood pressure and increasing inflammation in your body. Angiotensin 1 to 7 is a hormone that's involved in decreasing blood pressure, pression, blood pressure and reducing inflammation. And most of the body things, it's, it's not that one is good or one is bad, right? When, you're, when stuff happens, sometimes your blood pressure needs to go up and then your blood pressure needs to go back down. And that's why you have hormones that create a balance like that, right? The, the ACE2 receptor takes angiotensin 2 and converts it to angiotensin 1-7, right? Um, and what you see is, is that most people when they're younger, have higher levels of angiotensin 1-7. Aging causes a switch in that direction, as do certain types of disease. Um, and, and I actually, I wanna say one other thing. So because ACE2 protein converts angiotensin 2 into angiotensin 1-7, when it makes that conversion, it actually changes shape a bit. And so the SARS-CoV-19 uh, binds to the ACE2 receptor before it converts angiotensin 2. After it converts 
the end, the hormones, it changes shape and now SARS can't bind anymore. So you could see how a person with one type of profile where they had high angiotensin 1-7 and a converted um, ACE2 protein receptor might be better protected than a person who has high angiotensin II, which is causing high blood pressure and more inflammation, and an open receptor, right? Now, I, I do want to make clear that that's not to say that uh, ACE2 receptor is the be-all and end-all for a person's susceptibility uh, to COVID disease. Certainly, I mean, first and foremost, you've got... Um, you know, how your viral load upon exposure. The more virus you have is obviously gonna make an outcome worse, right? You also have your your individual's host immune response. And, and the more robust your immune response is, the better you protected you are too. I'm just saying that scientists also think that this ACE2 protein may have a role and may be contributing to worse outcomes in certain individuals who have that profile. Now, the reason why we care about that again is because it, it gives us opportunities for therapies, right? How can we uh, treat or prevent um, COVID-19 infections? And so just understanding those stages of infection now, I think you can see some clear pathways we can target the S1 protein and prevent the virus from attack, attaching to the cells at all. We could target the S2 protein and prevent the virus from actually entering the cell, right? But we could also look at therapies, um, and there are drugs that already exist that can either target angiotensin II levels, target the configuration around ACE2 proteins, uh, the number of their expression. And I'll just give you an example that I thought was really exciting. If I say it right, there's a there's a pharmaceutical company called Aperon, and it's actually uh, running clinical trials now where it's putting a, a floating form, a soluble form of ACE2 protein um, in patients so that it basically would mop up uh, SARS protein. So, so remember, Normally, ACE2 receptor or ACE2 protein is the door that's attached to the cell, right? But this company has taken the door off and just thrown it floating around in your bloodstream. So the SARS can still bind to it, but there's no cell for it to enter. And so it ties up a bunch of SARS viruses and, and then they can be mopped up and, and removed. So, uh, and, and you know, knowing that a vaccine is coming, but it may not be uh, available to everybody, the more options we have for different therapies, I think the more meaningful. The last thing I just wanted to say, is two actually things I want to say. The first is um, you may have heard of angiotensin II before, and you may in fact be on medications uh, that target, um, you know, either the enzyme that activates angiotensin II or uh, that blocks uh, binding of angiotensin II to, to blunt its effect, right? There are common blood pressure uh, medications that people use that, that target that hormone or its receptors. And so I do want you to know that it's important to continue to take those medications if you get COVID-19. Um, the research has shown that people do better uh, when they continue to take those medications. And in fact, those medications may be offering a protective effect for people um, in either getting or in um, not having severe consequences from COVID. So stay on your high blood pressure medication. The other thing I wanted to tell you is uh, Health Canada has created this wonderful video. Um, it's called COVID and the ACE2 surface protein. And it really takes you through a lot more of the biology. Um, and I think it's about a five minute video. It's not even that long, but, um, but it, it shows you pictographically what's happening. Um, and uh, I recommend that you view it if you, if you wanna get a better understanding of like, what does angiotensin II do? And why does it cause inflammation? That sort of thing.
And lastly, I'll just throw out there because I was involved in the panel a couple of weeks ago on masks and um, there was an article that came out in the British Medical Journal just yesterday that looked at all the different fabrics that people have been using for masks. And uh, so if you want to look that up, um, I recommend it. Uh, I, I didn't have time to read the whole thing in depth, but it looks like uh, they all do a pretty decent job is what it says. All right, with that, I will uh, hand off to Dr. Malarkey. Thank you uh, very much for that, Sandra. I really liked how you broke down um, kind of in very understandable kind of physical terms how that works. And I think we're going to dive uh, some more into that in the question and answer. Uh, but first, our next panelist is uh, Dr. Caitlin Malarkey. Uh, she's an assistant professor and associate chair of undergraduate education in the Department of Biochemistry and Biomedical Sciences at McMaster University. For many years, her research focused on novel universal influenza vaccine approaches. More recently, though, she's become immersed in the scholarship of teaching and learning with a specific emphasis on exploring advanced methods of delivering learning content. Uh, with extensive training and expertise in infectious diseases and vaccine development, Dr. Malarkey teaches biology, cell biology, biochemistry, immunology, and advanced laboratory techniques to undergraduates at all levels. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so Dr. much for having Malarkey. me. I'm, I'm delighted to be able to speak on this platform about all things SARS-CoV-2 related. Um, and I think Dr. Dorman did a really excellent job setting us up to understand some of the immune concepts that I'll discuss in the next 15 15 minutes or so. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is how vaccines work, okay? how vaccines work at the level of the individual, but also at the level of the population. Obviously, this is something that we're concerned about with the ongoing SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, and we're seeing transmission events increase every day. Um, and we want to know when the end is near, when we can stem the spread of this virus and go back to uh, our normal lives. Um, so I'm going to talk about how vaccines work at the individual level, at the level of the population, and then we can tie that into what a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine might look like, what's coming in the future. Um, and I can tell you that there are a lot of vaccines in development, a lot of vaccines that are in the pipeline. Okay, so um, how does a vaccine work, All right. The easiest way to think of a vaccine is that it's a rehearsal or a practice for your immune system. Right? We give you either a piece of the pathogen, sometimes in, in some cases, the whole pathogen. And what that does is it prepares your immune system if it were to see that pathogen later in your lifetime, okay? It, it primes your immune system so that the next time you see it, you're able to fend that pathogen off, hopefully without ever being infected, okay? That, that's the overarching uh, goal of a vaccine is to prevent infection full stop. Now, vaccines take advantage of some key properties are of our immune system, right? Namely, that our immune system has memory. It can actually remember a pathogen that it's seen before. Another key property that vaccines take advantage of is that our immune response actually gets better over time. So what does that gets better mean? I wanna unpack that a little more. Well, it's actually the case that Upon subsequent exposures, when our immune system sees a pathogen again and again, the quality of the immune response improves and also the magnitude of the immune response improves, which means the first time you see a pathogen, you will elicit an immune response, but it's going to take some time and it'll be a good response, but it's not a great response. Your immune system is able to store some of those, the information it gets from the pathogen away. Uh, it improves itself. And then when you see that pathogen again, you respond faster. The magnitude is, is higher. So you actually have a greater immune response and the quality is better. So instead of a good response, you have a great response, right? And that's, that, that is really what vaccines are taking advantage of, okay? That the second time you see a pathogen, you're going to respond in a, in a far more robust fashion, okay? So keeping that in mind, I think what we, we can build on there is talking about what Dr. Dorman told us in regards to the viral, virological aspects of SARS-CoV-2, okay? namely that we have this spike protein that is required for a virus to gain entry into our cells. And the key point there is that viruses 
need to access our cells in order to replicate, in order to make lots and lots of copies of themselves. If they can't get in, they can't replicate, they can't make copies, not only do you not become infected, you also don't go on to transmit that virus to other individuals. So most of the vaccines that are in um, development for SARS-CoV-2, the goal of these vaccines is to elicit antibodies to that spike protein, okay? So antibodies are just molecules produced by our immune system. They're just proteins produced by our immune system that can help by binding a pathogen. The idea here is that if your immune system was primed, it had had this rehearsal against SARS-CoV-2, these antibodies would already be present. And if you were to be exposed to SARS-CoV-2, those antibodies could bind to the spike protein and prevent entry into the cells. Okay? And that's what we refer to as sterilizing immunity because it means that your cells aren't even infected in the first place. There are other ways that antibodies can work, um, but this is the easiest way to think about uh, the neutralizing capacity of antibodies. They block entry into the cell full stop. Okay? Um, so that's how a vaccine would work at the level of an individual. We would give you some piece of the pathogen, maybe the, an inactivated version of the pathogen, maybe an attenuated version of the pathogen, your body would produce antibodies to that spike protein. And then if you were to be exposed to the pathogen in real life, you, would, you wouldn't even be infected because those antibodies would be primed and ready to go and prevent that infection from establishing in the first place. Right. Now, how do vaccines work at the level of the population, right? It's easy to just think about us as one person, but obviously there is a global pandemic that's happening and we need to talk about how we stem transmission at the level of the community, right? Now vaccines at the level of the community rely on a property that's known as herd immunity. Right? And what I mean by herd immunity, it's the maintenance of a critical level of immunity in the population that will therefore stem the transmission of the virus. Okay? And the easiest way to think about this is that if you have people that are immune in the population and they're immune because they've been vaccinated, they can no longer be infected. Therefore, the virus can't infect them and they can't go on to transmit to others. And so um, I'd, I'd like to show an animation here that helps to illustrate this concept of herd immunity. And I think given our audience here that we're talking about a workplace environment and safety in the workplace, you can think about this at, at in terms of a workplace exposure. Okay, so what you're seeing here with this graphic and it will continue to play over and over. So. Um, uh, we, you, we can follow along as the animation continues to play. So what you're seeing here is a population and in that population, let's say in that workplace, there are people that are susceptible and those are shown in blue. And then there are people that are immune and those are shown in yellow. And what you're seeing here as we move across the animation, working from left to right and then down into the second panel is that the number of immune individuals in this workplace environment is increasing. So we're moving from no immune individuals all the way up to 95%. Right? What you can see then is that as the number of immune individuals in the population increases, the transmission of the virus is, is stemmed. We essentially stop the spread of the virus because those individuals can no longer be infected and can no longer go on to transmit to other people, okay? So, and, and you can see that actually, the percent of people that need to be immune in order for this to work needs to be quite high, okay? It's not, it, it differs for different viruses. So if we talk about what percentage of people need to be immune in order to achieve herd immunity for, let's say, measles or mumps or influenza. It differs depending on the virus, but it's usually somewhere in the high 80s or 90% of people that need to be immune. Okay, so um, again, if we take this back to an example in the workplace, if, if you were to experience an exposure in the workplace and no one were to be protected, no one had any immunity, you would expect that, that the virus would spread very rapidly in that environment. However, as we add 
immunity into the population, we remove susceptible individuals, we can see very nicely that that stems the transmission. Okay? And this is, this is what we're working towards in developing SARS-CoV-2 vaccine candidates. We want to be able to provide immunity to the population, and that ultimately is going to stem the spread of transmission. All right. Okay, so um, keeping in mind how vaccines work at a population level, I'm just going to transition um, to talk maybe in the last five minutes or so about what vaccine candidates for SARS-CoV-2 could look like. Now, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of players in the field. Um, the WHO has listed over 100 vaccine candidates that are in some phase of clinical trials. 42 of those candidates are actually in human trials, with 10 candidates being in phase three clinical trials. And phase three is the most advanced stage of testing. Uh, it actually looks at the efficacy of the vaccine. So we already have 10 vaccine candidates that are already in phase three trials, which uh, is reassuring uh, from a uh, a public health standpoint, but we're still a ways off from having those be available to the general public. Okay. There's been a lot of um, questions recently about how a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine candidate could work, right? How long the protection that it elicits would last for, all right? And how often you might have to be revaccinated, and and whether or not it's a concern that the virus might change over time, and then that could affect the vaccine's efficacy. What we know about coronaviruses from studying other coronaviruses, um, like the seasonal coronaviruses that cause common colds, is that our immunity, our natural immunity that you might that you would experience through infection if you were to be infected with a seasonal coronavirus, it does wane over time, okay? And that is that is actually normal for the immune response. There's been a lot of discussions, I think, recently about how the immune response to coronaviruses wanes over time, which are important discussions, but it's, it's also important to note that all immune responses wane over time. So we need to ask whether or not that's significant in this case. But Going back to our conversation about seasonal coronaviruses, what we know from um, studying those viruses is that immunity seems to last for a few years, okay? So if we think about a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine candidate, we probably won't be able to get one shot and be protected for our entire life. Um, we do have some vaccines for viruses like that, all right? I'll point out that the measles vaccine, most people get two shots and they're protected 97% of people are protected for the duration of their lifetime. Then we, on the other hand, that's one extreme. On the other extreme, we have our flu shot, okay? And it's flu season. Hopefully everyone's going to their pharmacist or doctor to get their flu shot. And we know that we have to get our flu shots um, every year, okay? So we have some vaccines we can get once and be done. We have some vaccines that we have to get every year. It's likely that a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine would be somewhere in the middle here. It's probably a vaccine that we might need to get every few years, maybe every two to three or every five years, um, but that really shouldn't affect, be an obstacle in long-term immunity. There are many vaccines that we have to get um, booster shots every so many years, okay? So even if our immune response was to wane over time, that's not a major obstacle in the production of a vaccine. And maybe I'll just end here um, by having a note on, on vaccine safety, because I know that that, above all, should be our primary concern in the development of a vaccine. Um, obviously, these vaccine trials are happening at an accelerated rate. Typically, the normal timeline for a vaccine to move from the lab into actual, um, into the clinic and into eventually uh, humans takes somewhere around 15 to 20 years, okay? And it happens in a, in a stepwise fashion where we have our preclinical results, then that you move the vaccine into phase one, phase two, phase three, and so on and so forth. And obviously there are licensing hurdles um, to overcome that are related to the pharma for, well, are related to um, vaccine production and, and pharmaceutical industry. Um, our timeline has become shortened for this particular vaccine because of the urgent medical need, all right? But that isn't, that doesn't mean that we're cutting corners safety-wise, okay? What has actually allowed for rapid development is the fact that we have 
other pathogens that have allowed, that have informed SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development. Namely, we had vaccine candidates for MERS and SARS-CoV-1, okay, the first SARS that, that circulated in the late 2000s, okay. Our information about those candidates and how they work and our safety data for some of those vaccine platforms has accelerated the development of SARS-CoV-2. The other thing to say is that because of the urgent global medical need, there's been a huge financial investment from all sorts of um, biotechnology companies. And, and you'll know that many of the big companies like AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson are already have vaccine candidates in phase three clinical trials. So these, these um, companies are taking on a huge financial risk and starting the process of developing the vaccines even before they've been licensed. And that also helps to shorten the timeline of bringing the vaccine to market and to actually making it available to the public. That is all to say that we are still following all the, the normal safety protocols that are in place for these phase three, phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. And we're not sacrificing safety for efficacy here. Um, and the uh, governing bodies like the FDA have been very clear that they will not cut corners um, in licensing a vaccine. It will still have to meet the minimum, the criteria that they set out in order to be acceptable for the public. Wow, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Malarkey. That was, uh, that was fantastic. And I, I even just from the get-go, I, I like the idea of vaccines as a, as a rehearsal. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for um, infection. So, um, and yeah, we've got a whole bunch of questions that we can we can dig into. So this is so this is great. Um, but our, our first question is is going to go to uh, to Dr. Dorman, and and this uh, touches on um, the angiotensin, where, where you mentioned how it, like inflammation, um, how it plays a role in inflammation. And I know um, you're also um, you've done a lot of research on how diet plays a role in inflammation. So in susceptibility to say uh, SARS-CoV-2 does like how much should we be considering diet, you know, in addition to, you know, yes, we've got the vaccine coming, but should we be priming ourselves in other ways um, that you can talk a little bit about? Hmm. Oh, that's a good question. I didn't see the conversation going in that direction. Um, but um, yeah, angiotensin two is going to cause some direct inflammatory um, effects. And so an imbalance of it is, is partly through uh, reactive oxygen species. So diet most easily comes into the scenario in, in two ways, um, primarily because a healthy diet is associated with um, high levels of antioxidants um, and antioxidants will damp down. So the diet's not having a direct effect on your angiotensin tensin two activation, but it will have a protective effects on the downstream effects of that hormone, right? So having a, a steady stream of um, antioxidants will, will counter the inflammation and prevent the downstream damage, which would include primarily atherosclerosis, which is gonna be linked to um, you know, your cardiovascular type diseases and, and sort of the metabolic syndrome effect associated with type two diabetes. Um, but I also like to highlight with diet that A, um, healthy diets have a lot of the essential oils which can also protect the, the damage of the cells themselves. Um, so, you know, chronic inflammation can, can kill a cell or, or damage parts of the cell. Your essential oils will protect that. Um, and, and the essential oils, as well as some of our um, essential vitamins and minerals are critical to supporting the immune system too, right? So, so we talked about that importance of having a robust immune response. And um, I mean, even the, um, the ACE2 protein has zinc in it, right? Uh, your immune system relies on um, adequate doses of zinc, of vitamin D. That's that's a popular one that people are currently talking about, um, and all of the other essential nutrients. And uh, although most Canadians are not um, deficient in many of these nutrients, many Canadians are insufficient, and so they're just not as well protected. 
So diet isn't going to cure you, but um, it's going to protect you. I call it your personal protective equipment. Make your cells as resistant as possible before you have the virus attack you. Thanks, Dr. Dorman. Um, that, yeah, that makes sense. It's, it's not, yeah, you need to be a kind of holistic in the way that you kind of approach uh, uh, your personal wellness. And then, so Dr. Malarkey, um, so actually, one thing that jumped out was just, I had no idea there's so many, like the number of vaccine candidates. Uh, that's, that's huge. Now, do all like vaccines, I know you mentioned, so they, they, um, they've got that memory of your body um, for your immune system with the memory and it gets better over time. Can you talk maybe a little bit about the, the different types of vaccines? Like how are there 42 sure. different candidates, maybe like attenuated versus not and, and how that plays yeah. a role? Yeah, so there are lots of different types of vaccines and there are the easiest, there's some traditional methods that we have relied on for a very long time. And then what we're also seeing is newer developments, newer platforms that, be, that can be used for vaccine delivery. Um, so some of the oldest ways to make a vaccine or to actually just to inactivate the pathogen, to kill it, either through heat or through chemicals. Um, and then the pathogen is dead, but it still has all of the antigens that, that, that exist when it's alive and it's actually replicating. So when you give a dead pathogen to the immune system, it can still see that spike protein, for instance, and generate an immune response. But importantly, vaccines are safe. They don't cause disease, right? And, and that's easy to envision with a dead pathogen. Um, sometimes we can give not just a dead pathogen, we can give just pieces of the pathogen. Um, and in that way, we generate a very specific immune response. Um, another way that we can make a vaccine is by attenuating a pathogen, which means that it is able to replicate, um, but it is only able to do so at a, at a very minor extent. Okay, so it can replicate a little bit, but not a lot. And we make that by actually deleting genes from the, the uh, viral genome uh, that prevent it from being able to counter the host immune system to actually complete its infectious cycle. Um, so some of the vaccine platforms that are in development do exactly those things. They're using attenuated pathogens. They're using chemically inactivated pathogens. They're using just pieces of the pathogens that are produced. Some of the newer vaccine platforms are things like viral vectored vaccines um, or RNA vaccines. And those are really two of the leading candidates that we're seeing. So the vaccine out of at Oxford, out of the Jenner Institute at Oxford is a viral vectored vaccine. What that means is that we actually use a different virus to deliver the spike protein as an antigen. Okay, so we use a virus that is not replication competent. It can't actually infect the cell, but it, it can't actually replicate. It can infect the cell and it can deliver this antigen. Um, so it's, it's a, kind of a safe surrogate of the coronavirus vaccine. So that's the vaccine that's being developed in this. It's in phase three trials with AstraZeneca. Um, the other vaccine candidate that is in phase three testing, and this is um, coming out of a company called Moderna, and they're, uh, they are developing this uh, along with uh, the Vaccine Institute um, out of, in Washington, DC, the Vaccine Research Institute. It's an RNA-based vaccine. Okay, and that's not actually a platform that we've seen before. It, it is literally just RNA, it's just nucleic acid that's delivered into the cell. That RNA, the cell can take that RNA and then it can translate it into protein. So it takes the genetic material, it gives it to, it, it delivers it to a cell and then the cell makes the protein itself. So it, it would take the RNA, it would make the spike protein itself and then it could generate an immune response to that. Um, so that's a really new technology that hasn't been licensed before. Uh, the preclinical results are pretty exciting. It seems to uh, generate robust immunogenicity in phase one and phase two, and there seem to be fewer side effects, um, probably as compared to some of the other vaccine platforms. Wow, that's uh, I know I hadn't heard of that before. So that's that's pretty cutting edge stuff. That's that's exciting, right? And and um, it very exciting. There are some questions related to, because it's not a, a licensed vaccine platform that we've used before. There are some questions around development and ma manufacturing in particular, manufacturing and scale. Okay, so if we think about this is a global pandemic, how many 
billions of doses do we need to stem SARS-CoV-2 transmission? If it because of the whole world, mostly it, besides people who have already been infected, uh, are susceptible. So it could take somewhere around 16 billion doses of vaccine in order to stem the spread of transmission. Um, and being able to scale up these platforms to deliver those doses could present some challenges that we haven't experienced before. And it could also delay the delivery of a vaccine to market. Right. Thank you. That's that is a very good important. Just the, the when we're talking global, that is you know a whole bunch of other factors that that pop up that yeah you know, we haven't seen before. So that's that's a really interesting point. Um, and and we do have another uh, quick uh, question for you, Dr. Markey, from the audience. And then um, in terms of say how you know if one of these candidates' uh, vaccines is successful, um, would it protect us from future uh, SARS coronaviruses like MERS, or is that something we could expect? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of depends. It depends how similar the, this new virus is to SARS-CoV-2. So what we can, what we know from other coronaviruses like MERS and SARS-CoV-2 is that vaccines developed against those particular pathogens, they confer partial protection. Okay, so we can see what is called a, um, uh, a cross-neutralizing antibody response. So your immune system can make antibodies to MERS and SARS-CoV-1. Um, there are some similar features to SARS-CoV-2 and that uh, provides partial protection. Um, so it would depend on how similar or different the pathogen was to the, the SARS-CoV-2 strain that's circulating now. If it was very similar, it might provide a high level of protection. If it was very different, it might provide very little protection. That makes a, a sense. And so it's only, we, you know, it's just a matter of time. We'd have to wait and see to kind of, and what uh, nature. Yeah, and you know, it, these zoonotic infections, right? All the evidence um, points to the fact that this virus probably originated to bat in bats. Um, they can be hard to predict. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you. And then, uh, so I think we've got time for for one more question. And so I'll, I'll put it back to to Dr. Dorman. And so, kind of considering everything we've we, we've talked about here, is there something that yeah a takeaway for workplaces when it comes to vaccines and return to work that that you could uh, talk a little bit about, Dr. Dorman? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, building off of uh, of what uh, Dr. Malarkey said, I I think what's partly exciting is that this rapid investment and um, broad scale innovation um, is gonna have long-term consequences for the prevention of future disease, um, including diseases that may be like uh, SARS or MERS uh, that, that come up, but, uh, but maybe even more broadly, like um, this, is, this is really, I think unheard of the the scale with which globally companies have responded and, and developed this. And I mean, I think from a innovative point of view, I think we're seeing that across the board in occupational um, settings. Uh, everybody has been uh, innovative, and I think we're going to see a lot of long-term positive outcomes because of that. That will be meaningful. Um, I know that's hard to sort of focus on when we're in the when we're in the midst of the you know the awful, uh, but I but I do think that positive outcomes will come from that. Um, I guess being a health promoter, I think it also speaks to me about the importance of daily practices of um, maintaining our our general health at all ages. Right, we are a a, a population uh, of aging individuals and I think maintaining that constant baseline health is important at all every stage of our life and so what I you know I try to encourage people um, Dr. Peguerero talked about this last week uh, crises is a is a moment to for change it's an opportunity for change take the opportunity today to induce personal change, whether that is uh, going for a walk every day or meditating as Dr. Kaholic uh, recommended, or um, you know, making some dietary changes to include more plants so that you're, you're getting a healthier diet. Uh, now's the time because when there's all kinds of things happening, your behavior patterns change and you can instigate new positive 
uh, outlook. So that would be my final message: is is uh, grab the grab the opportunity today because it presents itself. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dorman, and and really so. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much to, to Dr. Sandra Dorman and to Dr. Caitlin Malarkey uh, for taking the time today to, to share your expertise um, in such an accessible manner. Um, I think you've really um, helped them, like me for one understand kind of how you know, the biological infection, the mechanisms behind it and, and why vaccines work and why they're important. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to both of you today. Um, and at this time, I'd like to thank all our, our previous panelists as well and, and all the CROSS personnel who contributed to making um, the CROSS COVID conversations a, a successful series. Um, so, and thank you to everyone in the audience who, who took the time to tune in and submit your questions. So uh, uh, while CROSS conver COVID conversations may be over, um, if you want, you can watch the whole series at any time at CROSS.ca. Um, so once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Dorman. Thank you, uh, Dr. Larkey. And from all of us at CROSS, I uh, wish you uh, stay well and stay safe.